I'm going to be talking a little bit about history, a little bit about the future, and about all of us in the present and what we can do. In fact, you should have been given a uh, note index card and a pencil when you came in, because we're actually going to be doing a little interactive, uh, active learning, radical pedagogy exercise together in this room to get some ideas together. Um, by the way, that, all that is, um, the index card and pencil were designed by a student of mine from LaGuardia Community College. who She's featured in the book, one of the heroes in the book. And uh, the pencil changes colors as you touch it. Uh, you can t <laughs> if, you're, if you've got warm hands, it'll turn bright yellow. If your hands are cold, it'll take a while. But it's just a funny idea to talk about what we can do in flux. This is my first time back in Chicago since the passing of one of my dearest, dearest friends. And I'm dedicating this, this program to her today. Um, she taught cognitively and physically handicapped uh, young people who were wards of the state. Uh, kids who had been abandoned and we were in orphanages. How many people in, here, in the room are teachers? Okay, I had a feeling there might be some teachers here. Whether you are a teacher, whether you have children who feel indebted or angry at their teachers, or whether you had your life touched, good or bad, by a teacher, I think teachers are incredibly important to the lives we lead. And um, right now there's a teacher shortage in 50 out of 50 of our states. Right? The teachers have not been treated very well lately, and it's a profession. Applications to education schools are way down. Part of what I'm going to say today is we have to do something about that. We have to go back to valuing teachers for what, uh, I mean, they are our future, right? We're giving the future to a younger generation. There certainly are some problems they're inheriting, and teachers are in incredibly important to all our future. Uh, Charles was one of the lucky ones. He had a family income. He graduated from Harvard. His goal in life was to pursue theoretical chemistry, not the kind that you can make money off of, but the kind that maybe will come up with something abstract, theoretical, that might change the world someday. Then his father lost the entire family fortune in the great financial collapse. Right? So suddenly he was going through what many of my students go through, which they call whimsically, ironically, but not entirely um, uh, with humor, a quarter-life crisis. You're 25, you're not sure, you have your college degree, you're smart, you're ambitious, and you have, don't have a clue what to do with it. The quarter-life crisis. The difference is, the Charles I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes was not some anxious millennial. He was Charles William Eliot, who was the president of Harvard for 40 years. Okay. Um, Charles Eliot was uh, a Harvard graduate. And he was teaching at Harvard at a time when no one expected a Harvard professor uh, salary to cover the cost of living. Because it was assumed every Harvard professor had an independent income. Right. Then his father lost everything in not the financial crisis of 2008, but the fir world's first ever global financial crisis, the Panic of 1857. Okay. Ma there are many reasons for why there was a worldwide financial collapse. One of them was the new invention of the Morse code was um, communicating word of the collapse faster than anyone had a solution to stop it. So technology had gotten out of people's hands and they didn't know how to pull it back and curb it. There were market after market collapsed as the information was coming through. Um, but most Europeans blamed the crisis on American naivete. And Eliot agreed. America had become globally powerful with, and uh, was a great place for industrial capitalism and for invention and for creating new technologies, but was very poor at training a generation in how to be socially responsible world leaders and global financial leaders. Uh, the most common verdict was it was the American education system that, had, that was at fault, and especially higher education that trained an American elite. In 1857, all of the private elite universities, colleges at the time, were still based on the old Puritan colleges and were designed to train ministers. Only about 10% of students were going into the ministry, ministry, but it was still a traditional um, education for the ministry, not for global industrial, the global industrial world. Elliot, in, uh, 
it, thought he was going to go into industry. He couldn't support himself as a college professor anymore. And then a grandfather died and left enough money for he, him to go to Europe for two years with his family and his two little children to study those European universities that were thought to be so superior to the American ones, the Humboldtian universities in Berlin uh, and the French national university system, universities that had been totally remade for the modern industrial world to train a new professional managerial class. There was no equivalent in America at the time. He came back, he taught at the one Polytechnic in America, a brand new school that was based on the European model called MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, was still a scrappy new school and it paid a living wage. And while he was there, he wrote a scathing, scathing indictment of all of American edu higher education called the New Education, which he criticizes everything and then comes up with a lesson plan for how higher education can change. It requires courage to quit the beaten paths in which the great majority of well-educated men have walked and still walk. Conservatism is never more respectable in than in education, for nowhere are the risks of change greater. Interestingly, Harvard at the time was going through a crisis. They'd lost three presidents in quick succession, and they offered the presidency to this 34-year-old Harvard graduate teaching at MIT and being so critical of higher education. And at the age of 35, Charles Elliott became president of Harvard. He and his colleagues spent the next 40 years creating a system of higher education that would create a new professional managerial class that would come up with all of the systems that would decide what professions were, how they should be cred credentialed, what kind of training you needed, and how they should be ranked. This is a list, oh, sorry. He knew that already K through 12 was already training farmers to be factory workers, but something had to be done for um, an upper middle class and professional class. So his equivalent was, and this is so abbreviated, I could go on to 10 of these slides. These are some of the things that barely existed before 1860 and were fully instituted by 1925. Mandatory public secondary schooling, K through 12 curriculum requirements, land grant universities, research universities, majors, minors, electives, division, certification, graduate school, collegiate law school, nursing school, graduate school of education, collegiate business school, degree requirements, credit hours, grades. Statistics, standard devi deviation, spreadsheets, blueprints, return on equity, punch clocks, IQ tests, giftedness, learning disabilities, multiple choice tests, college entrance exam, multiple choice college ent entrance exams. The SAT was fully established by 1925. Association of American Universities, tenure, sabbaticals, faculty pensions, school rankings, donor name chairs, corporate sponsorship of research, adolescence, and the F. <laughs> the F is one of my favorites. It's a great story. The first university in America to choose to go from long, thorough, discursive, written out comments that gave you feedback on your ideas, the way it had been done for a long, long time, either talked to or written out ideas, but to reduce all of the complexity of what you learned in a semester to an A, B, C, D, or as we'll see, F grade, was Mount Holyoke College a women's college that wanted to be modern and scientific and new and prepare women for the professional managerial class. If you go to the archives of the, of the great debate on whether to move from written out discursive comments to ABCDF grades at Mount Holyoke, the big issue is, what do we do about the E? <laughs> ABCD doesn't stand any, for anything, right? Just top, the top grades. They were so worried, though, if they gave a student an E that somebody wouldn't think it was the fourth best grade, but that it stood for excellent. That they had, after, after much debate, months of debate, they adopted the F for failure. It's the first time in educational history where when you don't do something, you're considered a failure, right? There's a big difference in not passing versus having a branded, right? A, B, C, D, you're not branded. And F, you're a failure. The second institution that we know of that adopted ABCD after grading was the American Meatpackers Association. <laughs> if you go to the archives of the American Meatpackers Association, they're also debating like crazy. But they're not, they don't really care about the E or the F. They don't think something as complex as sirloin or chuck can be reduced to something as simplistic as an ABCDF grade. So, 
to this day, I interviewed some meat packers about uh, six years ago. To this day, every piece of meat can be traced back. So you don't just have an ABCD, they actually don't use the F, ABCD grade. You can actually find who gave the grade, what kinds of, what range of grades they give, what their expertise is, and basically the, what we would call in, in, in information world, the metadata, all the back-end data that goes into reducing everything to a grade. Meanwhile, educators take up the ABCDF grade like wildfire, with almost no talking, except for the progressive educators who are opposing all of these changes, but very little talk about, really? Is it really a good idea to brand a student with a grade and then leave it at that? Does a grade really think, comprehend all the different ways we think all the different accomplishments somebody has had? Does averaging, averaging out all the different things somebody does really constitute a fair assessment of their contribution? And is college really about credentialing, giving a grade, or is it about learning? And that, of course, is the big debate. Why do we go to school? Do we go to school to indoctrinate? Do we go to school to credentialize? Do we go to school to learn? Basically, in formal education, we learn in a way that we don't learn any other way. Imagine if you're teaching your child to walk, and you gave the child an A, B, C, D, or F grade every time they failed or didn't fail, right? Or, or didn't. That is terribly anti-motivational, right? This is called summative grading, where you reduce everything to one sum, and then that sticks as a definition of you. It's the worst thing for motivation. We've got... Uh, uh, Research on this, it goes at least as far back as Maria Montessori. Uh, Montessori, of course, was one of the people that was pro protesting this. Interestingly, at the same time that we have Harvard being transformed, and in fact, all of America's universities being transformed, financed by the great industrial capitalists of the era. Some people back then would have called them the robber barons. Right? Um, we also have new universities uh, being formed at, whole, from whole cloth as research universities. Johns Hopkins in Maryland, Stanford in um, California, and of course the University of Chicago in Chicago. Right. We also have um, the land-grant universities are created in the, 18th, in the 1860s, and then again after the Civil War, with, uh, including with the creation of the historically black colleges and universities because of Jim Crow. Uh, that would be a different lecture, but college is not innocent and the perpetuation of, of Jim Crow by any means. Um, we also have the creation, also here in Illinois, of the junior college system. Joliet Junior College, Joliet High School, um, creates Joliet Junior College as one of the first junior colleges explicitly to train high school teachers. Because one thing you don't do in the research university is teach anyone how to teach. So that gets farmed out to junior colleges because suddenly it's compulsory that students stay in school. In Illinois, it was till 16. In some places, it's 14. But there's suddenly compulsory secondary education. There's no one to train those teachers. So the junior college system is largely created early on to, create teacher, to train teachers. However, and this is why it's so hard to change higher education, the same people that created all those things that I read in that card, Charles Elliott and his friends, that created all those things that I read on that, uh, on that one long list, also created the ranking, accreditation, and credentialing system by which each college would be ranked. Right? With all of those features part of that credentialing system, and guess what college is the pinnacle against which all of them, including Joliet College, is going to be judged? Right? Harvard, of course, of course. That makes no sense, right? As one of my friends who's the president of LaGuardia Community College, a college I do a lot of programming with, um, says, our job is so much harder than Harvard's, right? Their job is to choose the top 4%. Our job is to educate the top 100%. Think about what that means. Every, she says, every day I wake up thinking, what about the young woman who dropped out of college at 16? out of high school at 16, and now she's got four kids, and she lives at the poverty line, and she wants to go back and get a high school degree and a, and a college degree. How do I reach her? What, maybe I need to offer my classes only during school hours. Maybe I need to have childcare. Maybe I have to have somebody who can pick up those kids and take them to school. How do I teach the top 100%? That's quite a mission, but it is not the mission of 
uh, the most elite universities. And yet everybody is judged that way. Here's a great example. Uh, Hampshire College, founded in the 1970s. You're a Hampshire College graduate? Yay! Progressive school. In 2014, Hampshire felt that it was kind of losing its way. Like every school, it proudly put up the SAT scores of its students. We have lots of research on SAT scores. SAT scores correlate perfectly with income level. You can put up a map of higher of SAT scores, a national map of SAT scores, take it down, put up a map of uh, school districts by, econ by economics, take it down, put up a map again and say which is which, and people can't tell the difference. They're almost identical. Right? We also know what SAT scores do for the rest of your life is train you to take SAT exams, right? There's not a lot of opportunity, right? We don't really live in a world that's where you have to choose the best of five possibilities, right? <laughs> I mean, if you live in that world, I want to join you because my world is crazy, right? I mean, um, so Hampshire College said, we not only won't worry about SAT scores anymore, we will refuse to collect or communicate any SAT score data ever again. That doesn't sound that bold. They said, we, we can find out more from essays, from their grade point average, from their attendance, from the projects they've done. We can find students who match our values. It's been a fantastic success. They have more of the kinds of students they want, few applications from the students they don't want. It's been a total success, except they can no longer be ranked. Right? The system is so referential that if you make a choice not to use SAT scores, you cannot be in the US News and World Reports ranking or in other national ranking situations. Right? That's a way that you're regulating the regulators. The same people that make all of those rules make, uh, are the founders of the American Bar Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Sociological Association, the American Anthropological Association, the Modern Language Association, uh, the American Association of University Professors. Right? So you have a system where you're constantly ranking and credentializing with a, in a system that's vast, right? The world of community college and the world of elite education is very different, but it's the same ranking system. Right now, only about 15% um, of our student body are residential, traditional age, for attend attending at four-year colleges. Right? We have a vast array, a vast array of kinds of students Again, the ranking system is set up for a very different kind of student, for the, tra the so-called traditional student. So Charles Eliot's project was to train and define a new professional managerial class. Right? You may have all seen the study that came out in October, this October, that 94% of all of the job growth in the last 10 years has been in the so-called gig economy. Uberized work, contingent labor, part-time labor, labor where you take responsibility, like Uber, you buy your insurance, it's your car, right? And you get called whenever there's a ride, but no security, no even way of guaranteeing what your income is going to be, all the liability on your side, right? 94% of the new job creation of the last five years is in that category of contingent work. One in every two classes at your colleges today are taught by Uberized labor, by adjunct labor, the equivalent of those Uberized drivers. So your typical college student now is being trained for work by somebody whose life is every bit as contingent, at least half of the time contingent as their own lives are going to be. All, right. All of this started, the new industrial age, the post-industrial age, started on a very special date. Rare, I'm a historian of technology. Rarely in his histor history of technology do we have a date. We have a date. On April 22nd, this is an, boy, this is such a good Illinois story. On April 22nd, 1993, Larry Smarr and other people from the National Center from Super for Supercomputing Applications, the University of Illinois, came out to the world and said, we scientists have been using this really cool thing called the Mosaic 1.0 browser. It's a browser that you can use with the internet that allows anyone who's on the internet to easily, you don't have to be a computer scientist, anyone can use this, to easily communicate anything they're thinking to anybody else who has an internet connection with no editor, 
no publisher. Oh, and also no recall button, right? It's permanent and it's spontaneous, right? They made this available to all of us free. For corporations, it was a very minimal fee. For everybody else, it was free. That's astonishing. That's one of those moments in the history of technology where hu the human re uh, reach has suddenly been extended. Right? I don't know that college, I don't know any of us, maybe until the last year, even became fully, Equifax in the presidential election made everybody think, whoop, we, we better learn some things about this internet thing. Right? I don't think any of us were fully aware of what it means what it really means in an epistemological sense. How do we know the world? In a sense of um, a power. What power do we have to be able to communicate anything to anyone else in the world who has an internet connection without a publisher, without an editor, to censor, to say this is good, this is fake news, this is real news, right? This is reliable, this isn't reliable. This is safe, this isn't safe, right? Uh, two sociologists a few years ago put up this gorgeous site that allowed you to download all this cool free software. All you had to do was sign a terms of service agreement. So you signed the terms of service agreement and then this pop-up came and said, thank you for signing away your firstborn child. The first sentence of the agreement says, you can have few, few, uh, free software, but you're giving us your firstborn child. 94% of the respondents clicked and gave away the rights to the first point child. <laughs> I bet I do it twice a day, and I'm in this field, right? Those terms of agreement are written so we don't pay attention. Right? I believe we need a new kind of digital literacy that's the equivalent of defensive driving. Do you all know this cartoon? The original came out in 1993, and it's two dogs talking, and one dog, dog literally, after the internet was invented, was released to the public, one dog said to the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? <laughs> the day that uh, the supercomputing applications people released the, uh, the uh, Mosaic 1.0 browser, there were 20 websites in the world. By the end of 1993, there were 10,000. Internet use increased 2,500% during that year, right? So this is one of the fastest, most global inventions ever. But I'm not sure any of us ever predicted. And I'm, I'm on the board of Mozilla, the people that do the, the board of directors of Mozilla, the people who do the Firefox browser. So I'm with the people who were there, right, who created the internet. They had no idea that one result um, in 2017 would be not just anonymity, but weaponized anonymity that would be used to steal our per personal data, right, to possibly steal an election. Right? All, of my, all of my Mozilla friends long years ago said anyone can break, in, break into a Diebold machine. Right? And this year we were able to do a pretty amazing thing. I don't know if you've been reading about this. At the developers convention in, in Las Vegas, every year where all the world's developers come together, they set a hacker challenge. This year's hacker challenge was four Diebold machines and said, see what you can do with them. Within 90 minutes, they had, um, I think it was Daffy Duck was the president of the United States. I mean, they broke into those machines and made black, white, upside down, you know, everything you could do with them, easy, easy. People who had never seen the code before were able to do everything with those machines. Anyone who's a programmer could do that. We have a lot to be teaching students. We're still teaching them very much the way Charles Eliot designed um, in the 19th century. Right. When I read that long list, I bet there wasn't a single thing on the list that made you think, I wonder what that is. What are grades? Hmm. Credit hours, weird. What are credit hours? Right? Oh, strange. I, won I wonder what in the world a sabbatical or tenure, are, tenure is. Right? What are majors and minors? What are distribution requirements? Right? None of those things need to be explained to any of us today because that is the university we still have. Our world has changed dramatically, crazily, dramatically changed. But we're still teaching the next generation who are inheriting this crazy world as if the main job of education is to credential them 
for professions that have gone through enormous, even catastrophic um, disruption. Uh, newspapers now make more of their revenue from clicks, from following you through false news or fake news or things that say 10 ways to do and every time you're going through those tedious slides, what you're really doing is picking up a trail of advertisers who can then micro-target you and that revenue goes back to the original source of the, argument, of the article. That makes more money now than the old-fashioned ads in newspapers do. So think about what that does to journalism. Everything is clickbait. So the question is, I'm now going to turn it, and now's, I think, your chance with those pencils and index cards. What just happened? Yes, thank you very, very much. Did I do that? Sorry. I believe what we need to do is change education so that students take charge of their knowledge. That instead of it being top-down, hierarchical, and about credentialing, it has to, we have to teach students how to become responsible actors in a world where anyone who has an idea can communicate that idea to anybody else who has an internet connection. When I teach my classes, I hardly ever use technology. That's my calling card, so I do teach classes in um, This Is Your Brain on the Internet and other kinds of um, classes that are based on, on digital literacy. But I always do it with pencils. I take it back, with two great technologies, machine-made paper and machine-made pencils. Right? So I'm trying to, tell, uh, to talk to my students about interactivity, thinking for yourself, what happens in a world where you're not trying to find information anymore, but you live in a world of enormous and abundant information. How do you sort it out? How do you think it? So one of the things I do in my classes is something I learned from a second grade teacher. I've also um, seen this done at medical schools. It's an exercise called Think, Pair, Share. It's an exercise in quick writing, in, I mean, in thinking, in listening, in collaboration. We'll do an abbreviated version of, it, of this. I've done this with seminars of four students. I've done this in lecture classes with 400. I've done this in the Philadelphia 76ers Auditorium with 6,000 IB teachers. I also do consulting for businesses, and I did this with the most sheepish, most alpha, uh, follow the alpha person in the room group I've ever worked with, which were the, top, the CIOs and CEOs of the top 100 companies that report to Cisco. Uh, and in fact, the president of Cisco, John Chambers, said to me, oh yeah, if I'm in the room, no, I never get a new idea. These methods allow every student to have a say and have a voice in the classroom. But before we go on, you're going to do it. So um, pencils and papers, 90 seconds, there's no right answers, no wrong answers. Write out very quickly, if you could tomorrow change higher education, what three things would you focus on? Really quickly, off the top of your head, no right or wrong answers. There's, this is a three-part little exercise. Three things you would think of that you might want to do to change higher education. Or if you think education is perfect, then you just say, I wouldn't change a thing. Ninety seconds, just ninety seconds, very quick. Ready for part two? So now turn to somebody near you. And I like to do this in a very formal way because we have, as educational sociologists tell us, that 20% of students graduate from college saying that except when they were called on and had to speak, they never once spoke in a classroom. To me, that's just tragic, right? If you're sending students to college and they're coming out into the world and they spent four years in college and never heard themselves articulate an idea in a classroom, we are really failing. 
So when I do this in class, and as I said, I do a version of this exercise. I always change up the question, change up the format. But every class, my students know when they come in, there's going to be some moment in the class, very quick, where they're going to hear themselves speak and have somebody else listen to them. And then they're going to have the opportunity, which is almost as valuable, maybe it's more valuable, to learn something from someone who's not the teacher. right? Because the other thing about higher education is that it mimics this version of the audience where the ideas come from one direction, not from multiple directions. What this does, it says, in any room, there's genius, right? In any collectivity, there's untapped resources. So I've been involved in lots of community organizing this year. And we use these techniques in our community organizing. It's amazing how it changes. Those three big mouths that are always dominating it, right? It makes not so fun to be in, in meetings sometimes. Suddenly, everybody has a chance, had a chance to speak. So what I'd like you to do, again, 90 seconds. One person read, the other person listen. The other person read, the other person listen. And then come up with one thing you might have to add. It might be a compound sentence. One thing you might want to share with the whole group. 90 seconds, very quick, low stakes, just go, go for it. Okay, I hate to break this up, but that's 90 seconds. Excuse me, please, that's 90 seconds. Excuse me. I love that so much. <laughs> Teachers die for that kind of engagement. And it happens in every classroom. The same students that are bored to death. People say to me, do you ban, uh, ban cell phones? I said, well, you know, if I can't compete with a cell phone, maybe I shouldn't be teaching. When I do this kind of learning, my students are so engaged. And we've got the statistics on this. If you, t first of all, here's my favorite about this whole little. If someone asks you a year from now, what did, do you remember anything from, from Kathy Davidson's lecture at the Chicago Humanities Festival? The thing you're most likely to remember is what you just did right now. That's what active learning is, right? The other thing that's funny about that is you're most likely, even if you, it was somebody else's idea, you will remember it as your idea. <laughs> we all do that. We all do that. If all of you were to take an exam now on what happened in this room, right? and then um, people who were not in this room took the same exam, uh, since you haven't been told you're studying for an exam, you might remember, you might do about 9 to 10% better than the people who weren't in this room. Six months later, never over 8%. And that goes all the way back to studies that Dewey and Montessori did. Right? Basically, I always call it haunted by the 8%. You know, people are so worried about content. We've got to come get all the content out there. I couldn't do something like this because it would rob somebody of content. Are very naive about exactly how we remember the world. We remember very little of it. We remember what we're, my last book was about cognitive neuroscience. We remember what interests us, and then we follow that through. So what's so great about these kinds of things is it not only talks, helps my students, I do these gradual exercises where I help my students to think about their own thinking, take responsibility for their own thinking, but also reverse the hierarchy of always thinking you're learning from somebody else. Because on the internet, there isn't anyone else. It's you, right? It's you there with a machine that can get you in a lot of trouble, that can mislead you, or that can be one of the most astonishing things that humans have ever created. Right? We have to learn to control it, though. Right? If I'm doing research on humans, I have to go through a whole, it's called the IRB, a whole long process, complicated, maybe a little too complicated, but a complicated process about ethics, about my data, 
about how I will keep your privacy and, and, and how, what my security measures are and what ethical rules I'll follow, you can't sue the makers of algorithms. Right? You, there is no culpability for people at the level of the software designers. Right? The things that can steal our data, that can steal our elections, right? Right now, there's no culpability. My argument is we need to educate for that world. In the q and I would love it if some of you read some of your cards. I want to talk about two people, wonderful teachers, um, who actually are changing a mode of education to one that I find to be incredibly inspiring. Um, for all of us. But I hope in the Q&A we get to hear from some of those things. If this were a classroom, my students would be either going around and shouting out what they wrote on their cards together. They'd be writing because I want them also to learn how to collaborate. right? So I always mix up who they're talking to. And I like that idea of taking an idea and then making it work with somebody else's idea. It's a really important um, I, uh, uh, quality for the world we live in now. Um, or if I was teaching 400 students, we would do it on a collaborative thing like a Google Doc where they would all contribute and get to see all of the ideas in the room. There's always something I would never have come up with, never even have thought of, of course. right? And we, would, and we miss that in our classrooms. I think we miss about 90% of the knowledge in our classrooms by siphoning knowledge down to a very few things that I know and that you as students are supposed to, and my students are supposed to emulate. Right? Here are two of my favorite teachers. Mike Wesch teaches at Kansas State University. In um, a, a YouTube video you can watch, it's been watched by over 5 million people, called The Vision of Students Today. He turned a digital anthropology class into a research team where 200 students understood, learned, did all kinds of research on how they learn, what the internet is, um, and how that could affect the future of education. They turned it into a beautiful video, very low cost. They just synchronized and choreographed facts where they held, hold up facts. It's very, very powerful. Um, but the class I studied this year and wrote about in my book is a class he did on the anthropology of aging. Right? Instead of a normal general education class, these students learned all of their general education, math, statistics, um, biological science, history, anthropology, uh, philosophy, studying how aging is viewed around the world. But the cool thing is he asked his students, if you're going to take this class, you have to move, leave your dorm and move into a residential community, a retirement community. For a semester, his students live, his, they, their neighbors were not other kids going to the basketball games or football games, was other people in a residential community. Right? I think that's the most astonishing. They read deeply and profoundly and every day had to work on problems. Also, the, it was a wonderful um, residential community that wanted the students engaged, so they would present. Here's a problem we have. We have students, uh, a new law in the state of Kansas that requires fire doors. And we have some gentlemen in our, our, our um, community that are in wheelchairs, and they like to go to the bar at night. There's a bar in the, in the um, retirement home and watch the baseball game and, and argue about the scores, et cetera, et cetera. And they can't do it in the wheelchair. What can we do? And still have. They don't want to have to call somebody to let them through. That's demeaning. What can we do? And the students help to invent this um, automated, like a, you know, like a remote control thing to open these doors that complied with the rules. They talked to the men about what they would or wouldn't find uh, accessible. And they were doing electronics. So it kind of was everything. How do you solve a problem using all the different ways of knowing, including asking somebody? Incredible, incredible experience. They also made a digital game at the end so any of us could learn the kind of life choices that they learned um, in the retirement community. Another one of my favorites is Sarah Hendren. Um, in the beginning of this video uh, of the Chicago Humanities Festival uh, logo, there was a logo of somebody in a wheelchair. And it's the usual blue and white handicap sticker of someone sitting like no human sits upright in a wheelchair. And then there was another one of someone looking like they were racing, didn't look like somebody was dead because they were in a wheelchair, but in fact looked like they were alive and, and vital. Uh, that's one of the projects of Sarah Hendren, how to change our idea about what ability and disability is, uh, might be and how we can live in the world as humans because we're all going to be dis disabled at some point in our lives. We're all going to lose or not have the abilities that we once did at some point. 
One of the things she does, she's an artist. She works at Olin College, which is the country's first and I believe still only liberal arts engineering college, is she puts together skateboarders and wheelchair users. Why? Because they both are passionately interested in devices that let you go over obstacles. Right? And it turns out they all learn from each other. Right? And they make these phenomenal little things they fit pretty much in my, in a, what the size, something about the size of my computer case. And they unwrap like origami, and they allow people to have access to things they wouldn't have access to before. These are engineers. They also work with artists. But fascinating to have the most um, people who are thinking about how to make the built world more challenging, right? And people are getting over those challenges because their challenges are everyday life. Um, another one she did when I was studying her class I thought was fascinating is somebody came to them who is um, uh, an athlete, and I'm forgetting what his sport is. Sorry about that. But he has only one arm. He was only born with one arm. And the first thing she did, he, he came to them and he said, look at this thing NASA made for me. It cost over a million dollars. It looks like something out of Terminator. It weighs 25 pounds. I, I don't want to wear it. This, you know. Who, I don't, that doesn't do me any good. It had all these bells and whistles. He said, I want you to build me device, uh, some kind of device that will be easy, cheap, portable, and not like carrying around this dead body everywhere I go. And um, what Sarah did was she said, the first thing I want you to do is set my students a physical challenge. And she knew what she was doing. What she did was had um, all of her students climb uh, a climbing wall. And... Um, he climbed first, and of course, none of the able-bodied, two arms, two legs students could come anywhere close to his ability to climb with only three limbs. That was important because the starting point was not his handicap, right, but his astonishing abilities and how to make those better. That changes everything. The next thing she had her students do was go out and look at all the things in the world that managed to grasp things without a hand, without an arm. So they studied tendrils, right? They went to the zoos and looked at how animals hold things in different ways. Not always just with their paws, but sometimes with their teeth in different ways. All different ways, but she had them think about all the possibilities. Um, and what they ended up doing was, um, with him, worked on this thing that's like a, it's almost like a socket that goes on, he straps it onto his arm, and instantly, and he's ex unbelievably adept, he, can put on these different little lightweight tools that are very specific to what he needs them for. So instead of this huge Terminator kind of metal thing, they have, he have one thing that looks like a tendril that he can use to unscrew jars. Something else he can use, he's a, a, one of the things he does is scuba diving, and getting in and out of a scuba suit is difficult, can use it to zip and unzip. It's a different tool. Another one he uses for climbing walls. But it's inexpensive, it's um, practical, it's easy to care, but it also requires really thinking about all the possibilities of knowledge and collaborating together. My argument is college, and the one thing that defines, defines college for all students, whether at LaGuardia Community College or Harvard, every university in the country, every college in the country, is unlike K through 12, it's voluntary. Right? No one says you have to go to college. It's a good idea. We've got the, the data on how, how much of a good idea it is if you're going to have uh, choices in life. But it's not required. We humans are not very good at things that are voluntary. right? You probably know the, fa the statistics on gym membership. right? Your local gym would go broke, would go bankrupt, if all of you, me too, all of us who signed up for a gym memberships in January we're st and paid a year in advance, we're still going to the gym by February 15th. <laughs> but students have to stay in college four years against all of the pressure we're now getting that says college isn't worth it anymore, which is just a flat out lie. Right? Rich people don't say that to their kids. Right? The pundits who say that all have their kids at Yale and Harvard, and they've got tutors. It's really pretty ridiculous. Someone should do an ethnography of everybody who said college isn't worth it and find out what they're doing with their kids. Um, 
60% of students now hold, hold down jobs while they're going to college. How hard is it to be working 30 hours a week and going to school full time, right? That's a challenge, right? But they do it not just to make a better living, but to have a better way of life. We put a lot of obstacles in their path, one of which is an antiquated educational system. But I believe at every college and every university, there are people, sometimes around the edges, but there are people doing amazing things. I also know that the people who are doing amazing things are doing a much, much better reaching everybody. The people who are finding new ways of experiential learning, collaborative learning, this, this method that we did in here is called inventory learning, where everybody, everybody gets to participate in a solution. Um, it also helps the statistics of underrepresented minorities, of people who are first-generation college students, of people who are first-generation Americans, who now, in fact, are close to making up the new majority of our students in college today. And um, I dedicated my book to millennials. I think millennials have really been given both a raw deal given the cost of college and the obstacles to college now, the world they have to inherit, um, and everybody dumps on them, right? Oh, my. oh, young people are shallow and stupid because all they do is spend their time on their iPhones, right? Yeah, they're distracted. If I were 18 and inheriting this world, I, I would want to be distracted, right? This is a pretty, we, we have not given them a great world um, to inherit. So I believe that um, it's all of our jobs, and that's why I'm so grateful that you spent time on a Saturday afternoon to be here. But I think it's all of our jobs as parents, professors, pundits, policymakers, presidents, and just all of us as human citizens of the world to think about what we can do to support higher education and also to make it right and better for the world we're living in now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have about 15 minutes for a Q&A, 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A. I'd love to hear some of the things on your card or anything else. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, we do have a solution that exists now. It's called a liberal arts education. It teaches people to think, to collaborate, to problem solve. The problem is we're so focused on getting that first job, uh, whereas a liberal arts education teaches people to think about their third, fourth, fifth job. How can we change that paradigm? Thank you. So um, I went to Elmhurst College. Any Elmhurst College graduates here? A uh, small liberal arts college outside of Chicago where I had the most amazing, I mean, I was the worst high school student you could be. So Elmhurst took me in, God knows why. But um, I had, Gwendolyn Brooks was my introductory poetry teacher. Amazing, amazing. Amir, she invited Amira Baraka who was one of our teachers. She invited Wally Sienka, who was one of our teachers. It was incredible. I had all the Harry Who were my art teachers. It was incredible. I believe very much in liberal arts education, and I but I believe we need to rethink liberal arts for the world we're living in now. I think, for example, everybody um, who understands what it means to be human, what is our role as citizens, um, what responsibilities do we have to one another, what is democracy, needs to be looking at those questions also through the lens of um, uh, the algorithmic ways that all of that has been uh, orchestrated, mechanized, multiplied in our lives in ways that most of us are not really aware of. Uh, I have a student who's very worried about her research because she's a um, brilliant linguist and computer scientist who's figured out a way that just through data mining she can predict somebody uh, that somebody who might have um, mood disorder might be plunging into depression. So she's very happy about that. I mean, it's really amazing because not everybody has the resources, uh, either personal or economic, to, to seek help. And, she, and that, that's her motive. She's a first-generation college student, uh, immigrant family, so she, her motives are great. She's terrified of what happens if that algorithm got in the wrong hands. Would it be used to deny somebody insurance? Right? It would be... In, would it be used to exploit somebody? Because we know that when people are in a manic phase, they buy more. Right? So her ethical challenge is she's got this incredible thing. But she's, she is somebody who comes from a firm liberal arts background. She went to Mills College as an undergraduate. That's wrong. Mar Marist College as an undergraduate. Um, and so she thinks about those ethical things. And she said it's really hard for her to think that she could release this 
she does open source and all of that nonprofit, releases if somebody horrible is going to then use it to take advantage of people having a manic episode. Right? So I believe 100% that we need a liberal arts and a new reshaped liberal arts that takes into account not just the great books, but the great problems of the lives we're living in now. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. Couldn't agree more. We'll take the next question on the side. Uh, you mentioned Montessori, and it, my experience is that Montessori. I don't and, see. Where are you? Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Montessori and Waldorf schools uh, do a lot of the th things that you're talking about. Uh, everyone participating in learning and collaborative learning. What, what, what's your? Can you elaborate on that idea? Sure. I agree with that completely. And one of the tragedies of the world we're living in right now is actually K through 12 in general is more geared to that kind of learning and what that what learning is and Montessori and Waldorf much more so than even standard education. But now by the time you go to college, you've had 112 on average, 112 high stakes summative multiple choice tests. And in many, many places, teachers' salaries and retention are based on how their students do on these horrific tests. You can't both do the kind of inventory methods where you're finding out what everybody's ideas are and finding how to make those better, now to improve those and how to think collaboratively towards something bigger and more thorough and complex, and then say, but, every, but my salary and my job rests on you, Sonny, doing well on, your final, on the final exam. And so I, I actually think we're in a moment where we're doing mass child abuse um, with the kind of standardized output testing we do through K through 12. And K through 12 can't change until higher education gives up its fetishizing of SAT scores, right? Because no middle class parent wants to have their child be sacrificed, right? So if, you, if a teacher says, I don't, I'm not, no, we're not, gonna get, we're not gonna worry about SATs except for Hampshire College. You know, they can be really, really disadvantaged in everything they do. And the teachers can be. Teachers are very vulnerable. It's one reason why we have a teacher shortage in 50 of 50 states. Salaries have also, uh, teaching is like belies our oldest capitalist idea of supply and demand. 50 out of 50 states need teachers. You'd think the teachers would be like the highest paying per profession. It isn't. Right. We have five minutes left, so we have time for two quick questions. Great. We'll take one in the back and then the lady right here. Okay, um, <clears throat> my daughter's at Waldorf School graduate. I've taught elementary school. Uh, I created my own career, my own business. I've been a building inspector all over the country for 30 years for people buying and renovating buildings and helping them understand what they're up against. Wow, thank you. So with historical stuff too. But what's missing in the school that I've run to train people to be building inspectors in Chicago is uh, we need to combine Socrates and Mies van der Rohe. We need... <laughs> I actually think that's great, you, yes. You know, the Lyceum, where people walk around and argue and discuss and get passionate and, and fight verbally over their opinions, combine that with, okay, now, you want to be an architect? Put these bricks together. I agree. Put these yeah. two-by-four boards together. Let's see you make a roof. And, you know, I've got, I'm retiring, but I'd be willing to commit the rest of my years to developing that kind of education in this country. I, I think that is fantastic. I agree with that completely. And in fact, one of the reasons I talked about Sarah and Mike is both of them are not just talking about things, but actually taking deep, complex thinking, not superficial thinking, deep thinking as you said, Socrates, and really thinking about how that works in built environments, how that translates to actual things people do in the world. And that translation does change the retention rate of what we do. Right? Who, I mean, this is the big IQ. Totally, totally. But it's also the, you know, it's the, it's the key to the IKEA success. If you build that nasty piece of furniture, you're going to hang on to it the rest of your life, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I did it. I got it together. All the screws are where they should be. That's a beautiful piece of furniture. Right. Uh, there was one more question. Yep, we'll take our last question. And I do want to remind and invite you all to join us in the lobby for the book selling and the book signing afterwards. Who? This is two parts. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was um, I've been advising and teaching students at the University of Chicago for the better part of a decade now, so I know that it's very difficult to encourage students to 
um, follow along with what we want for them there, which is a sort of liberal education when these first generation students and these students that have um, come from immigrant families or internationally are watching their friends sign letters to Goldman Sachs. Um, this is not an easy thing to convince them of the value of thinking and learning and experience. And, and that it is isn't a challenge just first generation have. students. Right now, this is yeah. the most common occupation at I Harvard. was going to say specifically them, but I think it's everybody. And yeah. that's the challenge that we all kind of have um, the, to reinforce the value of liberal education in a world where um, it's not valued. Yes, the other you. thing I wanted to just ask you about, though, is about um, the idea of kind of play and collaborative learning as a kind of challenge to credentialing. So two of the, the common things... You said a word that got Yeah, lost. so sorry. The common thing that I noticed with the teachers that you've shown here and indeed with, the, with your comment here um, about learning is something about play and about <sighs> collaboration and how in some ways these, these notions of play and collaboration can even go along with something like coding to get students to kind of embrace a particular yes. kind of not only architecture of thought, but also a kind of spirit of collaboration um, and curation. Because really, your point about the internet is also well taken in that the idea is not that the internet is making choices for you, but that you're curating those choices. So the point is to kind of make sure students understand the nature of that curation. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how we can do that in a world and in a, in a system um, that values credentialing over this kind of collaborative work? So um, I always say that unless my class looks like a kindergarten, I'm not being deep and theoretical and tough enough. You know, I always, my classes always have markers and pencils and post-it notes and giant post-it notes. I have my students design my class. I, have, I, I, want, uh, I often will say, okay, first day of class, uh, I think this class should change your life. Bye, I'll come back in 45 minutes. Organize a class that will change your life. And I have students do that on the spot. And those are often the students that are most concerned about credentialing. But if you do some meta, what's, you know, educator word, I, I, you, know, you know this, metacognition, where you say why you're doing that. Even students who are very worried about con credentialing, we've got the research. We know it works. Right? So even if they're going towards credentialing, they know that once they have that job, they're going to have to do something with it. Uh, Google, um, I have a piece that's supposed to come out in USA Today as soon as it's a slow news day. That hasn't happened since August. So <laughs> but someday, it's about a, a two projects, uh, two studies that Google did of its own workforce. One is Project Oxygen, which is a study of individual achievement at Google, and one's Project Aristotle that just came out this past spring which is a study of teams that work. What Google found, and famous, famously, Google only hired, at, used to, it changed it after they did this data study, only hired engineers and computer scientists with perfect scores from the best universities. Turns out the people they promote play well with others, are collaborative, are creative, are imaginative, are multicultural, understand people from different cultures and different situations than their own. Those are the people that, in fact, Google itself was promoting. Google now has changed its employment algorithms. So you don't have to be a computer scientist. They're hiring humanists and philosophers. They're hot on philosophers. In fact, they're recruiting in every philosophy department I know now. Um, because they're good, data driven and their data showed they were wrong. Right? People need to have that kind of imaginative um, uh, creativity to succeed in a cutting edge country, company. Project Aristotle is more shocking because uh, Google famously has its A-teams, and A-teams are the very best people in robotics, working with the very best people in quantum computing, and, the very, and then setting them a challenge so they fight to the death against each other. And the B-teams are kind of everybody else in teams that are kind of more collegial. Turns out 90% of the big breakthroughs that have made the most money for Google are coming from the B-teams. And what do the B-teams say about each other? We like being with each other. There's no bully in our group. Everybody has a say. If I say something stupid, I don't get tromped on. People are willing to say, ooh, I don't agree with that, but let's, let's go there. Let's see what's going on there. Those are the teams that are succeeding. Right? It's great when your most data-driven, fancy, successful company studies its own data and finds those things. And that, so it gives us ammunition to those students who are obsessed with credentialing. And why wouldn't you be in this world of you know, quarter-life crises? Right? To be able to say, yes. And we can give you something that'll make, that even goes beyond your University of Chicago credentialing um, that really will help you succeed, not for graduation, but for everything that comes else. And that's basically what we have to do, is move from credential-centered -centered education 
to student-centered education, where we're saying the credential is fine, but that's your beginning, not your ending. Life is going to throw you so many curveballs, and you need to learn how to learn from what you've learned and learn the process so you can apply it when that curveball comes, because it will come. Sooner or later, it will come. Learning how to learn again, learning how to relearn, unlearn, and learn again are the real keys. Thank you very much for that great question. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.